Hey man, I'll go ahead and uh, take out your cell phones. Guys are coming around with hammers. They'll give you, I'm kidding, but seriously, take them out. Go ahead, pull them out, and just flip to your settings, okay? Make sure your volume is all the way up. Flip to your settings. If you don't know how to get there, you can ask a neighbor and they'll help you if they're under the age of 40. Um, and go to sounds, right? Go to your settings, go to sounds, and then you can find a little spot with your ringtone, okay? So you will never again be able to do this at Grace Bible Church, all right? All units all the way up, and then just play around with those ringtones. There we go. Yeah, we know how to do it. Volume's all the way up. How many can we get going? Yeah, let's go. There we go. Get those guys going. Yeah, you want that one? Ah, there we go. Listen to all that. You hear it? Listen to all that. Now, that is the world that we live in. That's the world that we live in. There's notifications, there's sounds for everything. There's sounds for different functions, for different notifications. There's sounds that you'll get to remind you to drink water. When you get a Fox News alert, you get a different sound. When you get an ESPN update, you'll get a different sound. When your calendar comes off, when, you're, when you get a text, when you get a call, when you get an email... They all have different noises to let you know that they expect your immediate attention. So now we get to shut all those off. You already have it in your hands, so silence it now. If it goes off in the middle of the sermon, we're going to mercilessly pick on you. Might even kick you out. I'm just kidding. Well, many of us say that we, we can't live without this guy, right? We, we would just straight up say it, like, we can't live, I can't live without, and if we don't say it, then many of us live like it, don't we? We look to it for personal connection. I have 3,000 followers. Self-importance. Dude, Ben Shapiro just retweeted me. Entertainment, I watched a whole movie on my smartphone in class. <laughs> Meaning, 300 people liked my post. Purpose, I have to put this on Instagram. People are going to go wild over that. It's going to get so many hearts and comments. From this little rectangular glowing screen, we receive glory, satisfaction, and worship. In this little world, it's all about us. But, look, that's not the way we live in the real world, right? So, it's okay. It's okay to forget about God and it's okay to forget about reflecting his character online. It's, it's different there. That's just, that's the way it works there. But Proverbs 1, 7 reels us back. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And what that verse does is it takes his finger and it puts it in our chest. And it says, the fear of the Lord applies to the online world as well. So we're going to look at 10 things Proverbs is saying about your smartphones so that we can live out our union with Christ in person and online. Because when the gospel makes you new, it makes all of you new. Now, what Proverbs essentially is, is it's a revelation of God of the social morality that he has built into his world. God's letting us know this world's been built in line with his character, and there's a specific way to live in the world that works, and there's a specific way to live in the world that doesn't work. Now, 
what Job and Ecclesiastes are going to help us with, and what Proverbs also says throughout it as well, is that sometimes it doesn't reveal itself the way that works until death. Sometimes it doesn't reveal itself the way that doesn't work until death. But when you stand before God, you will know the way that works and the way that, that doesn't works. It doesn't work. Proverbs is written for the people of God to make their way skillfully in the world. It applies to the way we use this glowing little tool in our pockets. And unless you say, oh, but I don't have one of those, I don't like those, I don't use one of those, it also applies to the rest of our lives. This just makes it a lot easier to do a lot of things. And so... We're going to see 10 things that Proverbs are saying about our smartphones that we live out our union with Christ in person and online. Because when the gospel makes you new, it makes all of you new. Number one, Proverbs 18, 24, and 27, 10. True friends are better than followers. True friends are are better than followers. Um, I'm going to go quick. So you can race me if you want and get to the passages, but I'm going to try to go real quick, and I'm going to beat you, and I'm going to read these after each point. Proverbs 18, 24. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 27, 10. Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend, do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. See, it's not about the number of people that you can call your friends. It's especially not about the number of followers you have. When life gets real, what God is telling us in Proverbs is that it matters how many close friends you can lean on. When you need someone to walk alongside you through the inevitable trouble of life, you need close friends. When life gets real, who cares how many hundreds of people you call your friends, who cares how many followers you have on Instagram, how many Facebook friends you have. What matters then is what matters always, the close friends you have. Many of you know Karen's family received bad news the day before Thanksgiving. Her brother, 49, two young boys, lovely wife, was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. She's not turned to her Facebook friends in that moment. She's not turned to her general acquaintances in that moment, in those moments. The closest family we have is six hours away. She's not turned so much to her family to lean on. But she's made close friends with some of you ladies. And you've come over and you've prayed with her. You've spoken with her. You've hugged her. And you close friends have been the ones who she has been able to lean on. That's what Proverbs is saying here. But right now, there is a loneliness epidemic, right? The most connected age in human history, and our suicide rates are at record levels. We've gotten deeper into our smartphone social connections, and our true friendships have become shallower. And when we go through the inevitable calamity of life that every single person, regardless of whether you love Christ or not, is going to go through... And we can't handle it. When Christ was here and he was going through his ministry, he had 12 guys mainly that he poured his life into. And then three of those 12 he became really close with. But do you remember what happens to Christ at his death? He's completely alone. Our Savior died a miserable death alone. The cup of God's wrath poured out on him. Why? So that we would never have to. 
You see, find a, find a friend that will stick closer than a brother. Invest in those who are close face to face. But realize, in Christ, you never have to be alone again. Invest in that relationship. Talk to him on a regular basis about the cares and concerns of your life. Hear him speak through his word, and you'll never again need to feel the loneliness your smartphone fertilizes and that he felt in your place. True friends are better than followers. Number two, it's designed to distract. It is designed to distract. Proverbs 8, 11. For wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. Have you guys ever found yourself just flipping through the Amazon app, looking for things that you don't need? But it's a lightning deal, right? So, I mean, honestly. Proverbs 18, 8. The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. And that's exactly what the news has become, right? News is just gossip now. Who did what with who, where? And then you skim through that article. Ooh, it's delicious. And then there's six more articles at the bottom saying, oh, please tap me, please tap me. It goes down, and it's delicious. It's like a, a delicious meal. But in reality, what it is, is it's a drug. And it's gripping you, and it's just telling you, you're going to need more of this. You're going to need a little bit, little bit more of this. 1924. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish and will not even bring it back to his mouth. Yeah, that's because the sluggard is watching YouTube. And he can't be troubled to be eating in the middle of this sweet video. I mean, millions of people have watched it, and there's tons of thumbs up, so... We can spend hours on YouTube, can't we? Avoiding the things that we know we ought to be doing. 29.9. If a wise man has an argument with a fool, the fool only rages and laughs, and there is no quiet. And then next to this, I don't know if it's in your Bible, in my Bible it has a little footnote at the bottom that says Twitter. <laughs> you see... This is designed to distract. That's its, that's its design. Okay? And so it's going to get us with these things, and we're going to spend tons of time on them. Why? Because there's tons of ads on those things. And it's money. And so in the ocean of variety of possible distractions, we get pulled to the right and to the left, and we're completely unhinged from the commission that Christ left us with, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Would that we were more like Jesus, who said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish my Father's work. He did that according to the exact timetable laid out for him by his Father. Now, if we were to get a peek into your life, what would we find? These are ad machines. They're designed to distract. So know this. If you're constantly distracted by this, you are getting played. You're getting played. And they're doing it in the most brilliant way, right? Because they're doing it in a way that says, you're just doing what you want to do. And it's ad Upon ad, upon ad, upon ad, upon ad, upon ad, upon ad. Because it's designed to distract. Your distraction is their design. So true friends are better than followers. It's designed to distract. Number three, family time is better than screen time. Family time is better than screen time. And Solomon's going to repeat this over and over again. Uh, two, one. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Uh, three, one. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commands. Four, 
one. Hear, O sons, the father's instruction. Be attentive that you may gain insight. Five, one. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding. Seven, one. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. What we get here is Solomon is committed to instructing, teaching, exhorting, commanding his kids. And that takes time, it takes attention and focus. There's no way Solomon's able to give the time, tension, and focus to his kids that necessitates that in order to teach them well if he's playing on his smartphone. I wonder if half of us spent as much time talking to our kids about the Lord as we do on our smartphones if less of our kids will be walking away from the church. In the words of Bodhi Bakum, if you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. I tell parents this every chance I get. You are the primary spiritual influence in your child's life. Our ministries over there, they're supplemental. They're secondary. They're they're to come along and assist you and help you and encourage you. If our ministries ever become primary in the spiritual influence of your children, the whole thing falls apart. Because we cannot undo in two hours a week what you have established in a whole week of neglect. Our smartphones can really ruin family time, can't they? Either mom and dad are so busy and consumed with their smartphones that they don't even bother to interact with the kids, or kids are so consumed in their smartphone that when it's time to put it away, what happens? Oh, man, the biggest eye roll you could imagine, right? And then two portions, double portion of attitude. There you go, have some of that. That's bad enough, right? But the worst is when it gets to the point that mom and dad don't care to interact with their kids. They don't care how long their kids are on the phone. The kids don't care about how to interact with mom and dad. And the whole family is simply indifferent to one another, consumed by their little glowing device. That's the tragedy. That they will one day look back years later and understand that they wasted years spent doing things that didn't matter with people they didn't know. We're wasting years doing things that don't matter with people we don't know. But Christ understood the importance of family time. That's why he made it uh, his custom to regularly go alone to a secluded place and spend time praying to the Father. He knew you can't have a relationship without close, regular communication about the things that matter. That goes for you and your family. That goes for you and your God. So parents, if this describes you, it's your responsibility to right the ship. You have to acknowledge, you have to own, and you have to ask for forgiveness for the wrongs that you have committed in this area both from your kids and from your God. And understand this. Your home isn't going to be right if your own relationship with the Lord isn't right. So we're going to need to go home this afternoon, put our phones down, and talk to the Lord about what's going on in our own hearts. True friends are better than followers. It's designed to distract. Family time is better than screen time. Number four, one heart without a filter is better than 300 with. One heart without a filter is better than 300 with. We're talking about Instagram there, right? It's a reference to Instagram. Proverbs 3.34 says, Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble He gives favor. 
Proverbs 11, 2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. Humility leads to wisdom and favor. That's what happens in God's world. That's the way he's designed it. Simply put, humility is always the way to go. In our hands, there's a massive platform. Potentially thousands of people can see and or read what we post. The temptation is massive to create an image of ourselves more like what we wish we were than what we actually are. It's tempting to make ourselves look prettier than we are, to make our families look happier than we are, our lives more exciting than it is, our opinion matter more than it does. Our phone and the influence it affords convinces us we are more important than we are. The lack of accountability for what we say makes us harsh and condescending. The opportunity to respond in the passion of the moment makes us mean. I've literally seen some of you on social media. I can't imagine you talking to each other on a Sunday morning like you talk to each other on online. And so we must ask ourselves the question, are we simply playing church or has the gospel made us new? You see, the mind of Christ was humble. The mind of Christ is humble. The one who emptied himself by becoming a servant. Though God, he was obedient all the way to the point of death, even the humiliating death on the cross. And you remember when Satan was tempting him. What was Satan willing to give him? Just worship me. Just worship me. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Just listen. Avoid the suffering. Avoid the humiliation. No need to humble yourself. I'll give you all the glory you want. It's not necessary to humble yourself in order to receive glory. But it was necessary And the glory that God gave the Son is far better than anything Satan could offer. He said, be gone, Satan. Worship the Lord and him only. But often we say the complete opposite. What God has to offer isn't worth waiting for. Let me sidestep humility and have a little glory for myself now. Wow. Look at all the hearts flowing in. Aren't I great? True friends are better than followers. It's designed to distract. Family time is better than screen time. One heart without a filter is better than 300 with. Number five, you're looking for in likes what only God's approval can give. You're looking for in likes what only God's approval can give. 1923, listen to this. The fear of Yahweh leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. You see, in Proverbs, fear of the Lord is the same thing as commitment, devotion, worship reverently of the Lord. And in that, the people of God are confident in God's approval. And it provides us with the deepest sense of peace and satisfaction that can be found in this life. And then this results in rest from anxious wondering. I remember the burden that was lifted and the sense of rest that I have when I finally gave my life to Christ. I was 16. I had heard the gospel. I knew the the judgment that I deserved for my sin and the rejection that I had for God's grace in Christ, it weighed me down like a heavy burden. And in the back of my grandparents' car, if they had shared the gospel with me on the way home from a hospital visit to my sister, I gave my life to Christ. And the immediate sense of 
relief from that burden. And the rest that I had, knowing I had finally given my life to Christ and that he paid my penalty and now his life was mine and I was free from my sin, both the presence or the, the payment that, I, that was required of me and the bondage that it had over me. It was the fear of the Lord that gave me that rest. But we're, we're so often looking for the counterfeit of that satisfaction. And we worry over the number of likes our posts get. How many views our videos have? Did anyone retweet what I tweeted? And it's never as many as we'd like, right? And if it is an impressive post, it doesn't last very long. Some of you guys had really awesome posts during Christmas. I didn't, I didn't see any, but probably. <laughs> it's so many likes. There were like so many hearts going on it, so many likes. It was awesome. It felt good. Even now, if I asked you, you'd be like, yeah, it's not really doing a whole lot for me, though. But especially, let me just get you back here in a year and say, how's that doing for you? What's it doing for you? It doesn't last. But there is a satisfaction. There is a rest that does last. And that comes from a humble fear of the Lord. A knowing that you are accepted. That's what we want in the likes, right? That's what we want in those hearts. Someone to accept us. We want people's acceptance. It's a counterfeit. The real thing comes from God. And you have God's approval. You get God's rest. You get that satisfaction from the highest one that can offer you his approval. Is it wrong to post? Is it wrong to tweet or put up a video on YouTube? No, of course not. But are you careful? Are you aware of the temptation to seek from it what God has designed you to only find in him? When you find yourself anxious about those hearts, those views, likes, and you start looking at your life experiences by how well they're going to do on your account when you take a picture of it and then post it, then you know. Then you know. Your little glowing rectangle has become your big <coughs> controlling God. True friends are better than followers. It's designed to distract. Family time is better than screen time. One heart without a filter is better than 300 with. You're looking for in likes what only God's approval can give. Number six, if you live by popular opinion, you'll be canceled in a few weeks. If you live by popular opinion, you'll be canceled in a few weeks. Chapter 16, verse 20. Whoever gives thought to the word will discover good, and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. See, the, the truth of God is unchanging. The truth of God is the only reliable source for gaining and living out objective moral truth. It is our job as Christians to both understand the truth of God's word then carefully make decisions based on the truth of God's word. But we live in a, in a cancel culture, right? Say the wrong thing about the wrong people and you'll be blocked, ridiculed, ostracized, fired, blackballed, canceled. People you thought were your friends all of a sudden don't know who you are. People you know believe the same thing, can't believe you said that. All of it is based on popular opinion. And the problem is, popular opinion changes by the minute. I mean, honestly, can you believe the people who still think it's okay to drink from straws that are made of plastic? <laughs> Those people are ridiculous. And the, now, the people that drink in cup, put your cup down if it's made of, of uh, paper. Okay? 
You disgust me. <laughs> it, just, it, it doesn't end, right? And it, and it changes. You will be canceled. Our phones and our social environment they foster draws us to base our decisions on the flow of the culture. And many Christians are getting sucked right into this, only to find down the line that they need to give up more than they thought they would have to. Oh, oh you mean I, so I can't believe in my bio? No, no. That thing is uh, outdated, totally irrelevant. Oh, but I, nope. But you see, Jesus was always at odds with the current customs of the day, wasn't he? Especially about the, the Sabbath. He, he touched the religious guys and the non-religious guys, right? And he always remained faithful to the truth of God's word and lived his life on the basis of what the unchanging scripture said. Some of us like to just be contrarians, right? That's not what we're talking about. Some of us like to equate our opinions with the teaching of Scripture. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about when the clear teaching of Scripture clashes with the current customs of our culture. That's when we have to stand on the Word of God. And we could apply this in our church culture as well as our greater culture. What does the scripture say? That ought to be the regular question that we ask. And our answer ought to form the basis of our decisions. So true friends are better than followers. It's designed to distract. Family time is better than screen time. One heart without a filter is better than 300 with. You're looking for in likes what only God's approval can give. And you, if you live by popular opinion, you'll be canceled in a few weeks. Number seven. To live well, there must be people telling you you're wrong. To live well, there must be people telling you you're wrong. 27.6 Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. True friends will love you enough to tell you the things you need to hear but don't necessarily want to hear. Your enemies will be satisfied to let you go on destroying your life and the people around you, just telling you the nice things that aren't true but you desperately want to hear. One night I showed a video by a Christian comedian at youth group, and the next day I got a text from a good friend here at the church saying, Look, I think you minimized some important things. I think you trivialized some things that I think we need to take seriously. And I said, ouch. And I tried every way I could to justify it, to explain it in, in my own heart, and I knew he was, he was right. It hurt. It was embarrassing. I didn't want to hear it, but I needed to hear it. And then I needed to go back to a youth group the next week and apologize to the students for showing them that and doing those things. I praise God for the way that that guy loved me enough to tell me what I needed to hear but didn't necessarily want to hear. But see, what this little guy will do is he'll let you form an echo chamber where only the people who say the things that you already believe are allowed to speak to you. Right? Here's how it works, okay? You've sinned, but you don't want to admit that you're wrong. And so you'll find somebody online who's, who agrees with you. That's not hard to do online. And then that becomes the basis of friendship online. Will you affirm me in my sin? If no... We can't be friends. Those are the, the hateful, bigoted people there. If yes, then we can be friends. Those are the loving, compassionate people. Then you'll go through life, and one day you'll die, and you'll stand before the Lord, and he will not affirm you 
in your sin. You see, Jesus Christ died so that when you are wrong, it doesn't mean your utter destruction. It means that you have the opportunity to repent and believe the grace of God in Christ. You see, some of you are here this morning and you are wrong about your existence. You think that you can be right with God just the way that you are, and you can't. You think you don't need to be completely devoted to Jesus, and you do. You think God could never sentence you to hell, and if you don't repent and believe in Jesus, he will. The character of Jesus' life alone tells us we're wrong. He was so much better The very reality of the cross tells us we are wrong. Our sin is so much worse than we thought. God is holier than we imagined. He required the death of his son to be satisfied for what we have done against him. His love is so much deeper than we thought possible. He stood in our place. He stepped in the way of his own wrath. His grace tells us we're wrong. You can't earn it. We receive his forgiveness by true faith, all in, fully committed, completely devoted, repentant faith in Christ. Our union with Christ tells us we're wrong. We're not autonomous, able to do whatever we want. We've been brought into a family, brothers and sisters with Christ and each other. And now we get to live in a family culture that God has established. When we hear that verse, faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. We can't help but think of Christ. Betrayed by Judas with a kiss, then wounded by the Father on the cross for our redemption and eternal hope. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you've not given your life to Jesus Christ, you are wrong. And you need people in your life telling you that. If you're here this morning and you love Jesus, there are areas in your life where you are wrong. And if you want to grow in Christ, you need people in your life telling you that. True friends are better than followers. It's designed to distract. Family time is better than screen time. One heart without a filter is better than 300 with. You're looking for and likes what only God's approval can give you. If you live by popular opinion, you'll be canceled in a few weeks. To live well, there must be people in your life telling you you're wrong. Proverbs is telling us these things so that we can live out our union with Christ. Number eight, gentlemen, The forbidden woman is now in your pocket. The forbidden woman is now in your pocket. Chapter 7, verse 21. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once he follows her, as an ox goes to the slaughter, as a stag is caught fast, till an arrow pierces its liver, as a bird rushes into a snare. He does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O sons, listen to me, and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Look, she's pretty. She's going to tell you sweet things. And when you're done with her, your life will be wrecked. 
You know when it's night. Nobody's going to catch you. You're not going to get found out. You know her address. You know the links to click. You know the searches that you need to make. And it all starts in your heart. That's where the battle begins. That control center, the emotions, the thoughts, the feelings. And what Proverbs is telling you is that all of that needs to be trained to understand that when you interact with this woman that way, you are a dead man. But this little guy makes it so easy, doesn't he? You can go get in a quiet place secret place, turn the volume down, and then you just stroll by the road where her corner is. What was Christ's interaction with this woman? He didn't exploit her or use her. He didn't disrespect her. He didn't humiliate her. He didn't even go to her, did he? She came to him. And he redeemed her from her sin. Not only did Christ conquer any temptation she may have directed toward him, he made her new by his death, burial, and resurrection. So your phone is such an opportunity for secrecy in this sin. So, fellas, if, if you want to have victory over this sin, you need to bring that out into the open. You need to find a good and godly man to walk alongside you. He doesn't struggle in this area. You need to put an app on your phone that's going to help you. And you need to repent and believe the gospel. Plead with God to make you new in this area. And have one of those close friends that you can call when you're starting to get tempted, not after you visit her. True friends are better than followers. It's designed to distract. Family time is better than screen time. One heart without a filter is better than 300 with. You're looking for in likes what only God can give. If you live by popular opinion, you'll be canceled in a few weeks. To live well, there must be people telling you you're wrong, gentlemen. The forbidden woman is now in your pocket. Number nine. Google can tell you the passage, but it won't alert you when you need it. Google can tell you the passage, but it won't alert you when you need it. Chapter 6, verse 20. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake your mother's. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they'll lead you. When you lie down, they'll watch over you. When you awake, they'll talk with you. These are figurative ways of saying make the word of God an internal reality that governs your thought, speech, and actions. When you lay down, let it remind you of your security in Christ. When you wake up, let it encourage you that God has planned your day for your good, Christian, no matter what you're going through. When you walk, let it guide the decisions that you make, the actions you take and don't take, the words you speak and don't speak. You see, Google is a great resource to find passages that you're thinking of. Okay? But it can also lull us to sleep, promising to be there when we need it. We assume there's no need to internalize the truth. All I have to do is have a phone. I can have it at my fingertips in a few seconds. But that's not how life works. Unless it's internal, it can't filter all that we say, think, and do. That only happens when it becomes part of our control center. The scripture says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. That's not just another verse. That is truth that God is telling you, internalize that. So that next time, you won't be rash with your words. You won't be rude to that person. Remember what Jesus did when Satan tempted him? Hey, Google, 
what are some Old Testament passages about bread? Because God's word was who he was. He knew exactly how to respond in the moment. Are you saturated in the word? Are you working hard to internalize it? Not just memorize it, but make it a part of who you are so that it directs and guides you in your regular decisions. You see, that's something that this guy can't do. It's so exciting to counsel some of you guys, and you're going through difficult trials and really hard situations in life, and then you will throw yourself into the Word. You'll memorize it. You'll be thinking about it. You'll see how it applies to what you're going through. And even though the trial's not over, even though you're in the middle of that trial, you're experiencing victory. You're experiencing hope and comfort and confidence. That's what happens when you make the Word of God internal. What Proverbs is telling us, so that we can live out our union with Christ online and in person, because when the gospel makes us new, it makes all of us new, that true friends are better than followers, it's designed to distract, family time is better than screen time, one heart without a filter is better than 300 with, you're looking for and likes what only God's approval can give, If you live by popular opinion, you'll be canceled in a few weeks. To live well, there must be people telling you you're wrong. Gentlemen, the forbidden woman is in your pocket. Google can tell you the passage, but it won't alert you when you need it. And finally, number 10, you can't avoid sin by avoiding smartphones. You can't avoid sin by avoiding smartphones. Chapter 20, verse 9. Who can say... I have made my heart pure. I am clean from my sin. That's a rhetorical question. The answer is, of course, no one can do that. Why? Because the most dangerous sin you and I face is the internal sin of our own hearts. To make matters worse, we have no methods of cleansing ourselves from sin. The only thing perfect conduct could do, if that was even possible, is not to add to the mess that we've already made. Some of us think that smartphones are the issue. If we just stay away from smartphones and keep our kids away from them, we can rest easy. But this misses the point, though, doesn't it? The issue is not with the phone, but our hearts. When we have prideful hearts that long to make much of ourselves, when we have lazy hearts that hate work, feel fearful hearts that play to the crowds, hearts that long to receive the worship our phones are ready to give, that's just going to be expressed in some other way. This makes it easy for all of that to be expressed, but it will be expressed some other way if you don't have that. We never get around the necessity of dealing with the heart. The most dangerous sin you face, the sin to be most concerned about with your kids, is not outside you, is not outside them, but inside you and inside them. This is only a little of what Proverbs tells us about our smartphones. They would point us away from our screens to more faces, warn you of the distractions, encourage you to put it down and spend time with your family, resist the temptation to exalt and promote yourself, looking for meaning and purpose in likes. Don't be pulled back and forth by popular opinion or surround yourself with people who will just tell you what you want to hear. Watch out for that lady. Internalize God's truth instead of relying on Google Google, and deal with the sins of your heart. Your phone is only a manifestation of what's already there. One guy has wrote, this world is filled with smartphones and stupid people. 
You don't have to be that. You may be saying to yourself, I've blown it. I fail in this area all the time. I sin in this area all the time. This is exactly, this is exactly why the gospel gives us a hope and a trust outside of ourselves. You see, the perfect life of Christ is what we're all counting on. And now the new life that we get to live united to him gives us hope that we can live in this world in person and online in ways that honor him. Repent and trust Christ as you live out your union with him. Listen. Hear that? By God's grace, you can take control of your phone and live in that type of world instead of the noise that we began with. Let's pray. Lord, give us victory. Remind us and give us the conviction that we need to live out our union with Christ in the context of how we use our our smartphones. These are not little worlds unto themselves, but they are worlds that we need to humbly submit to you. Father, would you give all of us that type of all-in, fully devoted, repentant type of faith in Jesus Christ that is required for salvation? We recognize that we are sinners and we are not depending on ourselves. We are depending on the life that Christ lived for us. But Lord, we want to be conformed into his likeness. We want to be more like Jesus Christ in this life, both in person and online. Help us to do that, Lord. And by your grace, as you do, would you simply use us to bring yourself honor and glory. That's our greatest, greatest plea. That's our greatest goal. We love you, and thank you for your love for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.